Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. Good job. Appreciate that. It's good to be with you guys. Thanks for being here. I know you could be a lot of other places, but it's good to come together, right? And again, if you're online, I'm glad you're together with us, at least online. That's good. So, um, yeah, that is interesting. Quick note on where we're going. We're going to run into um, Galatians in a couple of weeks, like in September. So I'm looking forward to that because remember I was praying about, you know, one of two things, Old Testament, New Testament. We're, we're going New Testament. And um, next Sunday, we're, gonna, we're continuing our Wisdom, Worship, and Worry series. We're going to be looking at sexuality and that in our culture, that's kind of a, a big confusing deal to our culture. And so we'll do that. But anyway, just kind of want to pave the way and, and let you know where we're headed in the future. So... I'm, I'm looking forward to that, but today we are taking a look at teamwork, wisdom and teamwork, wisdom, worship, and worry. Proverbs has a lot to say about the wisdom of, of being with someone, abundance of counselors, there's victory, that kind of thing, and I know every time I'm rock climbing and I fall off the rock, I'm really glad I have a team member that has a rope between us, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Anyway, so... Um, there's some practical advantages to this, but two are better than one. The passage that Bill just read, two are better than one, but then it ends and it says, but three are better than two. All right, so we're going to kind of unpack this, so that's where we're going to go. So <clears throat> some questions for you about teamwork. How, how would you define teamwork? Are, are you on a team? You might think, I, I don't have a jersey and a helmet, so I'm, I'm not on a team. Well, we're going we're gonna to dig into that. Um, and if you're on a team, are you a contributing team member or, or a distracting team member? What, what, what makes a team anyway? And what role does love play on a team? That's interesting, right? So we're going to be digging into that. Here's a, a, uh, an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with somebody else. Isn't that interesting? Here's another quote from a book called... Um, Unfriended, Joe Batiglia, here's a quote. We live in a hyper-connected world, and yet we're more disconnected than ever. We spend more time scrolling through Instagram than we do talking with our families. We've never had more friends, but we have no one to meet for coffee. Interesting. Our culture is, it, it, it's a great place to live. It's a great time to live. But there are certain weird things about our culture we just have to know to stretch, strategically kind of deal with them, right? Otherwise, we get swallowed up and go down this black hole. So, yeah, we, we've never had more friends, but we have no one to meet for coffee. And, and just looking at you guys, I don't think that characterizes us here. See uh, some coffee back there, and a lot of people are talking, and, and that's awesome. So, um, but still, that's the tendency that we can run into. Our microwave culture values speed and it values individualism, both of which are a threat to teamwork, right? Um, I don't know if you joined us, you know, teamwork, something as simple as a church picnic, you know, 87 people get together and, and that doesn't just happen like that. I mean, a lot of people, different people pool their resources and, you know, the space shuttle launching, that's a result of teamwork. And so from simple to complex, teamwork is all over the place. And I won't even start. Well, I do have a sports analogy with teamwork because that just makes sense. But, but there's all kinds of sports analogies where a team has amazing individual talent, uh, but they don't have a team, right? Remember my high school basketball team? I told you this months ago that they were undefeated through the entire season to the state championship, and they come out to Pershing Auditorium. Most teams come out, they run out. My team, high school team, walked out with their fingers in the air like this. So arrogant, and they lost. And many of us were secretly thrilled because we just couldn't stand their attitudes. But anyway, so you can have great individual people, but, but the team is, it's not automatic, okay? So that's kind of what we're doing here. So here's, a, whoop, there we go. What is teamwork? There's a lot of different definitions. Here's a simple definition. Selfless acts toward a common goal. So we're going to take this definition and run with it. And what do you have to have? To get a team, again, a lot of things, but here are a handful that you could add to this, but plurality, relationship, variety and differences, unity, trust, and communication. I'm going to put communication with relationship. So if you move any one of those, you, you kind of threaten the team. And so plurality and variety of differences. Sameness is not unity. Here's, here's a question to, to, to mess with your brain. 
if everybody was the same, is unity even possible? Think about that. Yeah, I don't think so. Sameness isn't unity. You can have people that are the same and, and be very divided. I think unity depends on differences, plurality, right? Okay, so, so that's when it, it, our goal isn't sameness. Our goal is unity. We can have unity even when we don't conform to, to the same certain things. Uh, certain things are essential. But, um, so, uh, humility, um, we need humility for a team to work. We need mutual conversation. We're open, are opening ourselves to uh, change and to risk. And um, here's our team. This is our staff team at church. Uh, we have, um, that's me, I, I speak here every Sunday. Uh, Christine and, uh, leads worship, and Andrew leads our digital arts world, and Mia holds everything together and more. So that's, that's our team. I love the team we have. God is doing great things through them. And I, t- I say at, at staff meetings, I say, I don't have all the answers of everything where we need to go. I'm counting on God speaking through you, so together we, we navigate where to go. And then here's our elder team, okay? So we have John, Dave, Jeff, Bill, and Tip. These are our elders, grateful for their leadership, but that's, a, that's again, that's a team. Different people, different skills, right? And, and so yet we come together and, and you hear ideas, and like, wow, I, I wouldn't have thought of that, or I, would, I wouldn't do it that way. Doesn't mean it's wrong. I need to back up and go, maybe the Lord has a direction and wisdom here through a different way of thinking about this, and so that's good. And I know this is too small, but we have so many teams here at church. I'll just, since you can't see it, I'll read it. You know, so um, I, I lead the, um, the team there. But we have children's ministry. We have the coffee team, facilities team, finance and accounting, hospitality, life group team, men's ministry, missions team, nursery team, offering and counting team. We count the money. Uh, prayer team, S- Samson Society, another men's thing, the security team, visitation team, waiting and hope team, young couples, uh, women's ministry, youth ministry. So I mean, we have a lot of teams. Apologies if I forgot you, all right? Or there, there might be another team out there that I, I didn't list. But we have a lot of teams here. And um, the idea here is that um, at church here at Grace Life, our, our, in one word, what is our church about? Responding. We respond to the love of God by experiencing his grace and extending it. So that's kind of that's the language that we're trying to, to, to cultivate. And our life groups are part of that. We have life group. We're going to kick that off here in a couple of weeks. But our life groups are all part of the values here. Our values are knowing God, experiencing his grace, and extending his forgiveness, growing in healthy relationship, and, and impacting others. And so if you think about the values down there in our life groups, well, well Knowing, knowing God and his word leads us to a vibrant relationship with Jesus. John 5, 39, okay, that, that whole verse is behind that. Um, experiencing his grace and extending his grace and growing in healthy relationships in the context of community and, and, and small groups. Um, I've talked about this before, how everyone's in the middle of being redeemed, right, of, of the, the practical aspect. And since we're in the middle, we're undone. There's rough edges, and, and, and I am not who I am now, who I will be in five years. I hope to be more mature and, and, and all that, and hopefully you too. So as we get together in life groups and small groups, we understand that you and I are in the middle of this long arc of redemption, and it, it doesn't have to be concluded today. That, that, that I'm in the middle of learning and becoming like Jesus. And because of that, as we get together in small groups, there's grace for one another to continue to be refined in the image of Christ and then impacting others. And here's, I, I spoke on this in January, but relational impact flows from an integrated life with God. Relational impact doesn't come from nagging, haranguing, corralling, and shaming and blaming. You can try that if you want, but just... Take my word for it, it doesn't work. So as we integrate God's life in us and then impact with others seems to flow seamlessly. Okay, so that's kind of where we're going. But um, teamwork, unity, men and women. Years ago, I was walking on Grace Campus down the sidewalk from point A to point B with another guy who was recently married and no one else was around. And I'm like, hey, what's up? How are you doing? And he does this. 
why did God make women? <laughs> yeah, and I laugh too. I'm like, oh, ha, ha. and I quickly perceive, uh, okay, it's not a joke. He's wrapped up. There's, there, there's issues here. And so I kind of quickly tried to think, and I go, well, uh, good question. I, I think because man by himself doesn't fully reflect who God is. Woman, by herself, doesn't fully reflect who God is, but together, they do. And so in his wisdom, he chose to create men and women differently, same team, same goal, different roles, and together we portray who God is. And so I thought that's, that's a good reminder. But again, same team, same goals, different roles. Think of football, right? The tackles built differently than the wide receivers. Same team, same goals. So anyway, not impugning any body type sizes to anyone here. Just saying tackles are usually big and slow. Moving on. So um, <laughs> right, in, in um, Genesis 18, he said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now, really, it's suitable. It means a cor- corresponding. I will make someone corresponding to him. And if, if the woman was made corresponding to man, that also, by definition, means that the man is corresponding to the woman, right? What he lacked, she brought to the table. What she lacked, he brought to the table. They, they complement one another, okay? Again, different roles, different way of thinking. Even our brains are different. The way we think and see, you know, you've heard the spaghetti, like, like women's brains like spaghetti, like everything's connected to everything, right? And the guys are just in a box, you know, and this is so true practically, like Donna, uh, I'm under the car working on stuff, and she's like, you know, well, Thursday at 6.30, should... I'm like, I, I can't, I just can't hear that right now. It's not sinking in. I, I've, I've been there enough to know. I'm letting you know. I hear the words. I'm not going to remember it because I'm all wrapped up in under the car engine stuff. Anyway, you, don't, you, you, you can probably relate to that. So we think differently, and, um, and that's good. And that God said to them, the man and the woman, subdue the earth, dominate it, be fruitful, and go to it. So we are a team to go out and do stuff in the world, all right? And then right away in chapter 3, we have sin, and we have shame and blame. And remember, remember this whole thing, how that worked? God plays along. Hey, Adam, where are you? Oh, you're hiding. Well, that, is this a game? What, what's up, Adam? That woman that you gave me, that's exactly what the text says. That woman that you gave me, y'all are messed up. I'm okay, but her and you, interesting. Right off the bat, we figure out shame and blame. And then three chapters later, right before the flood, it says, it says the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So, Back to men and women. Why are we not alone as men, or why are we not alone as women? Because it reflects the plurality of God in the Trinity, all right? So teamwork is patterned after the nature and character of God. We have God the Father, we have God the Son, we have God the Holy Spirit. And um, he's not just creator. If, If God is just creator... Who is he without creation? If God is just creator, who was he before he created? Okay, he he doesn't need creation to define himself. That's just something he does. It's not who he is. It's one of his little roles. Uh, What what about God as ruler? Well, he rules. He rules absolutely. Okay, I got no relationship in that, though. I mean, great, he rules. I'm more afraid than than love. So we have to think about God um, as scripture thinks about him. And in the Trinity, we have plurality, relationship, variety, differences, unity, trust, communication, and a million other things. But also we have love. Love is part of their teamwork. Love is part of the Trinity. And out of that love comes everything we experience. And that's kind of where I'm going today, okay? Love is part of their relationship. It says in John 17, uh, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. That's a long time ago. Love precedes creation, all right? So one of the, one of the ways 
we know God as, as a father. He is, and, and by definition, if you're a father, what do you have? You have a son or a daughter. Right? That, that's how that word works, okay? And so, so we, have, we have the father. He is a loving father. Now, right away, we get into a practical difficulty here because every one of us doesn't have a loving father, okay? Sometimes the fathers are uh, abusive or neglectful or, or just, um, you know, kind of sort of nice but just distant, Whatever, I mean, chances are 99.5% of us have, have some father issues. It's just degrees of father issues, okay? And we have, to, we have to deal with that. So what do you do if your experience with your heavenly father is horrible? It's so easy, wrong, but easy to project your negative father issues onto God the father and go, I can't trust him because I couldn't trust my father. My father wasn't there for me, so how do I know God will? And, and that's natural in our physical bodies in a fallen world, but we, we need to learn to not do that and instead project the love of the Heavenly Father, the perfect, faithful love of the Heavenly Father onto our fallen earthly fathers through the lens of our redeemed heart. And we're in the middle of that. That's, that's not easy. This is like a, a decades-long task that I'm giving you, okay? This is homework that's due in 40 years, because it takes a long time to have that ark of redemption unpack those 18 years or more of whatever you didn't get or you did get from, from father and or mother. But, um, and, and we don't want to let that taint our view of God as a loving father. And it does. And it takes time reading who God is and, and give yourself time but that's, that's a long arc of redemption, okay? And that's, that's a worthy goal to work through that issue, all right? So, um, and then we get to the son. Hebrews says the son is the exact, or he's the, he's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. If you've seen the son, you've seen the father, okay? One and the same. He, he, they said the same. Uh, the son is eternal. There, he, he wasn't created. He's not a force. He, he's not just a different mask that, that one God puts on. Um, love between the father and the son is shared. That love spilled over and creation resulted. And then sin came and severed that relationship. So God became man. Philippians talks about that. The Son is the only connecting point between man and God, Jesus Christ, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Um, so the Son responds to the Father by willingly laying himself down, and his response to the love of the Father should be our response. When, when, when God calls us to do something that's difficult, because of the love we have for the Father, we should respond just like Jesus responded. So again, response. How are you responding to the love of God? That is a driving question, all right? Jesus says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Who does not obey, whoever does not obey the Son by not believing shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. So how does the Father make known his love for the Son? Like if you were in a court of law and you had to prove, ah, see, evidence, the Father loves the Son. It would be, one of the things would be by, he gave the Spirit to the Son right at the time, and this is Matthew 3. At Jesus' baptism, when Jesus was being baptized, the, he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove coming to rest on him, and God the Father says, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. I love him. I'm sharing the Spirit. The love of the Father and the Son now includes another, okay? The presence of God, the presence of the Spirit of God on Jesus is simultaneous with the expression of love for the Son. Romans 5 says God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, all right? And here's a great verse in Ephesians. I'll read it, and I've got a little diagram to show you. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed, you were 
You are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, I've talked to you before about these chiastic structures. In, in Greek, the chiastic structure, it's like an X, and so you get half of that, and, and so you get this like indented thing. Um, and we'll move on here. So uh, in Ephesians 1, 5, 14, there's, there's a chiastic structure. You have, you have a phrase, to the praise of his glory, and eight verses later, you have the same phrase. And you, okay, that it's a mirroring, and then you have a comment on redemption, and again, redemption. And then you have language of an inheritance and language of being possessed by God, which is, is uh, fitting with inheritance, but it all focuses around being sealed with the Spirit. So being sealed with the Spirit is the central thought to that passage, and that's how chiastic structures work. But anyway, um, okay, so yeah, that was, um, so in the Trinity, there's love. I'm trying to say in the Trinity, there's love, and um, not all teams have love. Uh, the Trinity does. So this, yeah, this, is, this is fun. This is 2017. I don't remember many football games. Like, if you ask me who won the Super Bowl last year, I'm like, oh, I don't know. But, but did you see the commercial? That Okay, anyway, I like the commercials, but the teams. But I remember this game. I was watching this game, and, and, and here's, here's how it works. Alabama was playing Clemson. Alabama was looking for their fifth win national title in the past eight seasons. They're just crushing everybody, and they're expected to win, to win, to win. Well, in the first half, Alabama's Scarborough running back, he ran 76 yards, two touchdowns, and so halftime, uh, Alabama is ahead 14 to 7. And that's a halftime speech. I'll never forget this. They, 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 they interviewed the coach, um, Sweeney, uh, uh, coming out on the field. Uh, what did you say to your players? And he says this. I, I told him we're going to win this game because we love each other. I remember, I mean, my popcorn love, like, what's that? What kind of coach says that? Well, you love each other. What? I just was like, and so I, I've tracked that sense, and that is true. That's what he said. Um, so the game goes on here, and um, entering the fourth quarter, Clemson is down by 10 points, 24 to 14, behind 10 points. Alabama was 97 and 0 going into the fourth quarter when they have 10 points. 90, they have never lost when they go into the fourth quarter ahead by 10. And that's the position here. Alabama comes, um, so Clemson gets a score. They, they come back, it's 28 24. Uh, Alabama comes back, so they're ahead now 31 to 28, like less than two minutes left, and Alabama's ahead. And you're like, what do you do? You know, if you get 90 seconds. Well, they come back, and then there's six seconds left, and Clemson wins. They get a touchdown. And I'm like, man. And then Debo Sweeney, he said to his players, let the light that shines in you be brighter than the light that shines on you. And I'm like, that's just, that's just great. Anyway, so it made me want to be I'm not quite a Clemson fan, but I'm just like, you know, thumbs up for a kingdom perspective, right? Anyway, so I just, I looked at that, and, and I thought, well, there's a team that understands the power of love and, um, and what that can do for a team. So the best teams love is a component of that. And there's no other religious system like that. In fact, if you scan all of Scripture, you go back to the, uh, the Old Testament, like Mesopotamia, Syria, Babylon, and all these other, Persia, all these other places, you never have a God that's based in love. They're all angry and vengeful, right? So as you read the Old Testament, two key assumptions you have to understand. And here are the two assumptions. The plurality of the gods and the insignificance of man. That's the foundation work for the secular world of everybody in the Old Testament, okay? Now, the plurality of the gods, this is how this worked. If you had a good day or you won the national championship, in the, in the ancient Near East, they would say, well, you've acquired a god, because it worked out. You acquired a God and he blessed you. But if you lost the national championship or you get a flat tire, you're, you're friends and you would think, you've offended a God. But because there's a plurality of gods, you have no idea which one. And since the, these gods have not ex expressed who they are to you, you have no idea what you did or how to undo it. So you live in a constant state of panic and fear trying to sacrifice this, maybe that'll work, and you never know. So, so you're constantly afraid of the gods, and you see everything through this lens of fear and superstition, and, 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 and it just is exhausting. Do you have any idea what a privilege it is to have God's word? God said, this is who I am in great detail. We don't have to wonder who he is. What about sin? What do we do? 
Well, there's this guy named Jesus who came as God to deal with that. Do you believe in him? If so, you're good to go. I mean, no other system has that. So that is is pretty, pretty significant, okay? So in the ancient Near East, it was polytheistic, lots of gods. Humans are insignificant. Uh, you, you were un- they were unknown, and magic and fear dominate everything. That's why when you read this ancient history, magic and fear, it just runs everything because it comes out of their view of the universe. Biblical religion, not really relationship, it's monotheistic. We are the crown of all creation. We have value, and, and, and we're known. There's a relationship and love, so it's just completely different. I, I, I hope just that slide impresses you with was, was saying, thank you. Aren't you glad that you are alive now and not in ancient Mesopotamia? Yeah, me too. So here's, I'm gonna, this is just sit back and enjoy this. This isn't on the test, all right? It's just, um, it's just for fun. I just want to tell a quick story about how, how this, the, the family of gods in Babylon came to exist. And it's just crazy. So Apsu is a freshwater male, and Tiamat is a saltwater female. They get together, they have kids. But the kids make so much noise that Apsu wants to kill the kids because there's just all this noise. Seriously, I don't know what the deal is with noise in ancient Babylon, but they're upset with it, okay, because that's what Apsu wanted to kill the kids. Well, uh, Ea, one of the kids, and and these are gods, monsters, and everything else, um, but Ea killed Apsu to beat him to the punch. And so then to avenge Apsu's death, Tiamat created monsters to wage war against Ea and the gods. So Kingu was created to fight all these gods. And, um, and then, but they, you know, the, these gods failed to defeat Kingu. And so Marduk descends from Ea and these other gods want to kill Marduk. So guess what Marduk does? He comes up here and kills Kingu and kills Tiamat. And out of Tiamat's body, Marduk splits her body, and that's where we get heaven and earth. Because this, you have to explain it somehow. This is how they explain it. And, and then Marduk takes Kingu's body, and it's kind of the blood and gore and arteries, and creates mankind. And so that, according to them, is how mankind came to exist. And that's just all their little story. So, but here's the point. Mankind is created to do the, the work of the gods so the gods could rest. Because they're just so annoyed with work and noise. Just kill them all. Make them work. Isn't that weird? It's just a weird story. Aren't you glad this is your story? Where's love? Do you see love there anywhere? No love. All right? No love. So I'm glad that that's not our story. That leads us back to this text. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. This is just simple, practical stuff. If you got two and somebody falls, you can lift them up. But woe when you fall alone and there's no one to lift them up. Again, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can you keep warm alone? And there's no sexual in you. And our culture is all weird with sex. And we go, oh, you know. And no, they're just, it's just a practical matter. If, if you get two people, you're warm. Anyway, leave it as it says. Uh, Although a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. Three forward cold, cord is not quickly broken. That last phrase is a well-known ancient Near Eastern proverb. Everybody in the ancient Near East, oh, yeah, threefold cord. It's great. Can't break it. That's just, that's just everybody knows that. And he's simply saying, if two is good, three is better. Okay? Plurality, teamwork. Um, well, when would two not be better? Well, when there's no relationship, when they act independently, when there's no trust, when there's no common goal, a whole lot of reasons. Here's a verse, without counsel, plans fail, with many advisors they succeed. When there's no guidance, a people falls, but in abundance of counselors, there is safety. That phrase, a people falls, just doesn't sound right in my head, so I dug into it, and it just means a nation. So a people, it's, it's singular, like a nation falls, okay? Anyway, it, it took me like half an hour just to get my head around that. But, um, so, but what, are, what are we assuming here? We're assuming that with the guidance and the advisors, that people are listening to the advice and implementing the advice, which is where most of us fall off the truck, right? When we have to do something, change my life, change my values, change my priorities, change how I raise my kids, change how I spend my money. I'm like, it's too personal. I'm not ready for that. I think I'm going to live my life my own way. I'll, I'll maybe buy a Bible and set it in the house. 
whatever, keep, keep things distant, but to change my life, what? It's pretty personal. So guidance and counsel fail one of two ways. When we get bad counsel and we listen to it, or we get good counsel and we don't listen to it, it's actually pretty tricky, right? How do you know when you hear things? How do you know? Like you're checking out at Walmart and, and you know, the Esquire magazine or whatever weird, you know, Sun Times, you don't know, even Martians land in Wyoming. And you're like, wow, what do I do with that, right? Anyway, so you get what I'm talking about. Okay, so teamwork involves listening to others who speak wisdom. And I don't have time to read this, but if, if you would like a serious kick in the teeth, read Proverbs 1, because it is just smash mouth wisdom, all right? I'll just start you, and then you can finish this. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. This is wisdom speaking. I will make my words to known to, to you, because I have called, and you refuse to listen. You have stretched out my hand, and no one has heeded. Because you ignored my counsel, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when your terror come, when your um, terror strikes you when terror comes like a storm. And, and as it goes on, the, the simple are killed by their turning away and complacency of fools. It's just, it's just brutal. And then Proverbs 5, adultery. It, it says don't. Um, Proverbs 7, the loose woman, don't. And then Proverbs 8, wisdom is shouting. We talked about this a month ago. Where is wisdom shouting? In the busy streets at the city gate where there's so much noise and distractions and, and my phone's beeping and I got schedules. Oh, I'm 10 minutes behind in traffic. Wisdom is shouting. Can you turn, tune your mind into what wisdom is saying in your context in a busy world, a microwave world that values independence and values speed over teamwork and love? That's our challenge, all right? So that's... Um, that's there. So we were in Oregon a month ago, and this, these rocks here, the black, smooth, super smooth rocks, they're lava. Now, if you've ever seen lava, it's like super abrasive and like super sharp, and you can cut yourself and all that. But these have been tumbled by the waves a very long time, and they're super smooth. I just think that's neat. It, it fits this verse. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Uh, same thing applies to women, too. It's not just men, but, but we each other, right? And so you get this idea that when you get two people who have differences, you're like, I, I, I wouldn't do it that way. I, I'm not saying you can't or that it's wrong, but like, wow, I would never think of that. That's just, that's, that can be a gift. And you're, you're like, maybe, maybe we should consider that. Okay, interesting, right? Um, but the point here is because you have different people sharpening, Basically, wisdom is a community endeavor. It involves other people. Are you open to their input into your lives? Are you teachable? Here we go. We're going to get personal. Are, are you teachable, teachable about who you should date and marry? Are you teachable about how to raise your kids, how to spend your money? Oh, we learned early on in marriage, you just don't share how to raise kids with other people with kids. Somehow that, I guess, I didn't get the memo, but that's like verboten. <laughs> you just can't go there interesting unless you're teachable and it does work if you're like hey you're old what's your experience with kids <laughs> i mean that's there's an open door and then you can gently like well hey here's our experience and that's that's fair enough all right you can skip the old part but i'm just saying you know but really if someone asks you advice that's what they're saying <laughs> Anyway, okay. Um, what about politics? Can you engage in a conversation about politics without going emotional, going nuclear, and shutting down? Right? Interesting stuff. All right. So, um, and, and uh, another thing, teamwork involves partnering. Church at Philippi partnered with Paul. Uh, Moses partnered with his people he delegated to, and David partnered with his mighty men, and uh, my favorite mighty men of David is, is um, Benaiah, who went down, and it says, of all of scripture, it says, he went into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. I'm like, how does that contribute to the whole story of redemption? I don't know, but it's pretty cool, right? Killed a lion on a snowy day. So, um, and, and Paul, I'm going to zip through three missionary journeys, half of the book of Acts, just with three maps. The first missionary journey, Acts 13, 14, the point here is in blue. Paul teams up. He has a team 
John Mark and Barnabas. Now, John Mark splits later, but they come back together. So he goes all through these people with the team. Second missionary journey, right? They, uh, Paul and Silas start. They meet Timothy. The three of them go up. This guy's like, hey, help me. Remember, this is the whole background of the Philippian church. And then Paul and Silas are in jail. Paul is released, and Paul goes back here. And I, I don't know, Silas, I guess, I don't know what happened. But anyway, so Paul just goes on there. The third missionary journey Paul is teaming up with Titus, and it just says disciples are with him. So he, he does all this. The, the point is he's doing all that with other people. Now, selfless acts toward a common goal. Teamwork is not solo work, all right? Think of yourself in marriage. Marriage is a great team. You have differences. You, you bring different things to the table, and, and God, that's on purpose, Right? It, it, it's not to, to crush one view or the other. It's to welcome them to the table and entertain some different ways of doing things. But the team that I'm most amazed with in Scripture is the, the disciples. I just cannot get my head around this. Um, Matthew and Simon the Zealot. Now, Matthew was a tax collector. And how it worked is he would have paid ahead for the privilege of taking taxes in an area. So he, he, to the government, he gives a big fat check, and then he goes out and collects back his money, but nothing is there to prevent him from taking more than he paid. In fact, that's just what they always did. Maybe he paid $50,000 for the privilege of, of collecting money in, in a certain area. Well, he's going to pull in $125,000. There's nothing anybody can do. Furthermore, you could bribe Matthew and say, hey, I, I've got a bread factory here making bread and rolls and stuff, but the guy around the corner does too. I want, here's, here's, uh, $2,000, I want you to shut him down. And Matthew would shut him down. And there's nothing you can do. So the Jews hated tax collectors. And Jesus one day, while Matthew is actively collecting taxes that hurt the Jews, come, follow me. Jesus doesn't argue with him. He doesn't show all the wrongness of everything he's done and is doing. As he's collecting taxes, come, follow me. And then you've got Sim, uh, Simon the Zealot. Now, zealots get their whole model from the Old Testament. Phineas went in and killed a guy. They, they, they would publicly slit the throats. This is the Sicarii, a group of the zealots. But they would, they would violently resist uh, the Roman taxation. In fact, even when Jesus is talking about taxes, the zealots in Scripture, they perk up. Oh, oh what, what do you mean by taxes? Because they're looking for evidence that Jesus is on their side. In fact, the Romans thought Jesus was a zealot. Uh, and they, they treated him like a zealot. They crucified him with two other zealots. Anyway, so the, the, the question of the zealots is, would you accept a suffering Messiah who forgives and turns the other cheek following peace? <laughs> the answer is no. But while Simon the zealot is actively planning his next attack or who to kill, Jesus says, Simon, follow me. He doesn't... He doesn't first get him to, okay, you understand you're wrong here and how this is horrible and, and God's perspective, God's values. Just follow me. And I don't, I don't really know what to do with that. I mean, are, 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 are we saying we should be like Jesus and, and just love people where they're at before we convince them that they're wrong? I, yeah, I, I think so, but that ain't our culture. <laughs> is it? Oh, man. You look at the news and you, you're like angry instantly. And those people, there are, the, there are no those people in the gospel. Everyone's welcome as they're actively collecting taxes, as they're actively planning the next assassination. Follow me, Jesus says. It doesn't excuse the, the wrongness. It just, it just blows me away, right? So um, two are better than one because love is in the middle of that, all right? So Go back to our definition here, selfless acts toward a common goal. The best teams love marriage, football, certainly with the Trinity. You and God are a team. Do you love, or do you have selfless acts toward a common goal that the Lord has given you with him, with each other? That is a worthy question. So God is a loving father. His love spilled over to the son. They share the love with the spirit. Out of their love, creation happens, but we sinned. And so God's love caused Jesus to come to reunite us, forgive our sins. And he gives us the spirit as a promise of his faithfulness. That is a win. That is an amazing story. So our response to that should be belief in him. 
And scripture is very clear. Fruit is not salvation. Belief is salvation. Fruit is just fruit, okay? So keep those separate. So that leads us to our closing questions. Where are you making selfless acts toward a common goal? I'm assuming you're on a team of some kind. Is that part of your daily routine? Selfless acts towards a common goal? Are you contributing or distracting team member? Work, friends, marriage? And I suppose if I look at my own life, there's going to be like, you know, some days are better than others. That's okay, right? Uh, what role does love play in your standing and your execution of teamwork? Is it just shut up, do this, do this, three o'clock, get, get it done? Or, or is there room to love the people on the team? So um, wisdom and teamwork. Wow. Love is essential in a team, and we see that pattern after who God is, how he created us, why he created us, and so love can thrive in the midst of differences. We don't have to reduce everybody to the same thing in order to love and accept them, all right? Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you, you are so wild and extravagant with your love with Matthew and Simon the Zealot. I, I just find that it just doesn't look like a good idea, <laughs> but we're, you are wise and you are good, and I think to the degree that I don't understand that shows me that I don't really understand the depths of your love, and would you open our eyes to those in our immediate circle that maybe challenge us and rub us the wrong way and give us your eyes of, of just follow Jesus, and we let you do the heavy lifting of the, the value transformation in their lives and um, give us patience as they and we are on a long arc of redemption. Amen.